Good morning, St. James. Today I'm actually coming to you from my mother-in-law's place. We uh, uh, we escaped for uh, for a day to come down here, and it happened to be uh, the day that I normally record. So that's the uh, background behind us. Uh, I want to wish you all a, a good day, and, and I hope that this finds you doing well. Uh, I, as I say every week, continue to reach out to one another and um, and keep me posted about how how folks are doing. I I want to know, and, and certainly want to be able to reach out myself. Uh, there isn't a whole lot going on in the congregation uh, except for two things um, that I want to bring to your attention. Uh, one uh, is, uh, well, please read the, the weekly email because it's got details about other things going on. Uh, but one, I was incredibly uh, moved by the PATH Foundation's discussion uh, on racism and encourage you to take the time to, to watch that hour that's uh, that's in the weekly. It, it certainly is, uh, is substantive and, and two remarkable uh, human beings uh, who've, who've really uh, been on the front lines of addressing uh, uh, racism uh, uh, in our country. And, uh, and I'm just curious what questions and what thoughts uh, it engenders in you. So please take the time to, to watch that as we continue uh, to try to grow uh, in our knowledge um, and ultimately in our action. Um, and um, secondly, uh, I do have good news in, in terms of gathering for worship. We have been cleared for outdoor worship. Uh, and on the 12th of July, uh, we will have our first outdoor service. We've looked at our campus and it doesn't really accommodate it uh, very, very well, but we have uh, two parishioners that have uh, volunteered their space uh, and we will get you details as soon as we uh, firm them up uh, in the next week. And we will ask you uh, as we gather uh, in, in outdoor worship, uh, one, um, uh, we need to uh, to use proper uh, PPE. We need to be wearing masks and, and maintaining social distance. Uh, and we'll ask you to bring chairs um, uh, to this, uh, but also that you sign up so we have a sense of how many people will be there. Uh, but all of those details will be forthcoming. But the good news uh, is that we'll be able to gather for worship. Um, it won't involve communion, but uh, you can read all of the, the details that we know right, uh, right now uh, in the weekly as well. And with that, I... Uh, I wish you a great day, uh, and we'll begin our worship. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And blessed, blessed be, be his kingdom, kingdom now, now and, and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Quoting Father Randolph, good morning, church. Craig and I want to tell you how much you are missed. We are sending you all love and big virtual hugs. We look forward to reuniting in our church home. Take, Take care, care and, and be safe. safe. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Hi, I um, uh, welcome to my porch and uh, thank you for coming. And um, we built this house uh, about 20 years ago and I came here from, from up north with the uh, idea that I would uh, find a job down here and I did. Uh, and my job was the uh, director of Habitat for Humanity, and uh, for for uh, this county and the next county over. So I had two counties to look for, look after, and uh, and hopefully build homes for those who really needed a home. Uh, and one of the things that we all did was. We were very, very interested in in um, in a song, and if you don't mind, I'll sing it for you, and we'll see. You know the song very well, but it fits so well into what we are trying to do with Habitat and the church. You know this one. I, the Lord of Sea and Sky. I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will fill, I made the stars of night, 
It's a song that we often sang with the Habitat for Humanity. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful song that feeds right into the work that we were doing and the joy that we saw in people's faces as they continued. They built the, their own home, helped to build our own home with us, and it was a joy to have that experience with them. And so this brings us to praying, praying that we will always be someone who the Lord can, can count on. And we must seek the Lord in our prayers. So with your indulgence, I will read the prayers. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for this gathering and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church, especially Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan and Jennifer, our bishops, Ben and Ted, our clergy. I ask you for prayers for peace, for goodwill among all nations, and for the well-being of all people, especially for Donald, our president, the Congress, and the Supreme Court of the United States. We pray also for those in the armed forces, their families, and all deployed in harm's way, especially Mark. I ask your prayers for all those who have suffered or feared discrimination, mistreatment, or violence because of their God-given identity. Help us to understand, to acknowledge our corporate responsibility and guide us towards sustained healing, reconciliation, and unity. Pray, pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the, for the poor the sick, the hung hungry, the oppressed, the lonely, the burdened, the anxious, and those in prison, especially during this season. Pray for those in need or trouble, especially Karen, Judy, Helen, Carol, Steve, Bonnie, Omni, Christine, Steve, Judy, John, Joan, Kay, Ansel, Tina, Linda, Fred, Kay, Ed, Barbara, Anne, Marlee, Marie, and for those who we now name either silently or aloud, I pray, I pray, I pray for my dear wife, my children, my grandchildren. I ask for your prayers for all health.
health care and emergency workers, those who continue to put themselves at an increased risk to provide essential services, and those facing economic insecurity as a result of COVID-19. I ask for your prayers for all health care and emergency workers, those who continue to put themselves at an increased risk to provide essential services, and for those facing economic insecurity as a result of COVID-19. I ask for your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for St. James Episcopal Church, school and school, and our Stephen ministers and their care partners. I ask your prayer for the departed. Pray for those who have died, especially Dick Thompson, and for those whom we now name either silently or aloud. For my dear wife. I ask for your prayers for the people, for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for the faithful and growing relationship between the First Baptist Church and St. James Episcopal Church. We give thanks for our many blessings, which we now name either silently or aloud. Praise God for the, in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glory Christ in our own day. And wherever we find ourselves, we offer our prayers to you, the God who promises to abide with us. During this time, we may know and trust your presence in our lives. Continue to bind us together. Embolden us as your church to be signs and agents of your hope, your healing, and your love. We pray this in the name of your Son who came and dwelt among us, Jesus our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus said, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the, re of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a di disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The word of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I had promised, I had every intention of preaching on the gospel that you just heard, uh, and I wasn't even going to bring the other readings into the room, uh, largely because that first lesson, uh, that uh, lesson from Genesis, once you cart it into the room, it is like that proverbial elephant. All eyes are on it, and you can't get out of the room without addressing it. Um, but as my uh, preparation uh, continued throughout the week, I realized I couldn't avoid that elephant and so now I'm bringing it fully into the room. Uh, you may be asking yourself, what story is this? Uh, it is a story that is probably as written about as just about any story in Hebrew scriptures uh, and it uh, takes on a important uh, place in our in our holy days and in the, the Jewish holy days. Uh, it's referred to in Judaism as the Akedah, as the Akedah, the binding. 
and it's the story of the binding of Isaac. Uh, in our tradition, we refer to it uh, more as the sacrifice of, of Isaac, uh, but it is read on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, um, and every time the uh, ram's horn is blown, the shofar is blown, it's a reminder that God provided on that day and that God will provide. Uh, in our tradition, it's it's often used at the Easter Vigil as part of our telling of our uh, salvation story with God. Uh, and then on Good Friday, it's uh, it, it's a lesson um, that can be used as the first lesson for our Good Friday service. So very significant times uh, that this uh, this reading makes an appearance. Also, it's worth noting that the site of Solomon's Grand Temple is there at Mount Moriah, right there where this takes place. And that's not accidental. Um, the place where the ram was, uh, was offered as a burnt sacrifice uh, in place of Isaac uh, becomes where people will come and, and make sacrifice to God. Um, it also uh, uh, is the site, current site of the Dome of the Rock, uh, which is part of the conflict uh, that is going on. Uh, but uh, its significance there is that it's also believed to be the place where uh, Muhammad uh, ascends to heaven. But uh, all of that uh, to say that this story has been instrumental uh, in the, the Jewish and Christian faith, uh, but it's not without its complications. It is not an easy story to talk about. Uh, and uh, several, uh, several readers, several faithful readers uh, have suggested uh, it'd be better if we just skipped on past it um, because it is so troubling. Uh, and I do think that I find myself firmly in both camps. As a flatter story, as somewhat almost a parable, uh, I think it's beautiful. I think it has uh, an incredible richness, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, as a fully human story uh, with robust characters that have uh, uh, real lives uh, with real consequences. It is a troubled story, and, and I think um, it's a flawed story. I cannot begin to imagine uh, uh, sacrificing my child. Uh, I, I cannot begin to imagine uh, what it must have been like for that child. Uh, all of that is incredibly complex. Um, but before we get to all that, let's go back to uh, um, the story and before the story. So we'll start at the call of Abram before his name was Abraham. Uh, and remember, God uh, came to him and said, your ancestors will outnumber the stars. Uh, you will have immortality. And that's sort of what uh, folks thought of as immortality, uh, that, that uh, your progeny, uh, you would live on through your progeny, that they would, uh, they would outnumber the stars, that a great nation uh, would, would come from your, your seed. Uh, what a gift. Uh, that's as much as any human uh, could ask for in that day and age. Uh, and uh, for folks that were a, a little bit older and hadn't had children as even a, a bigger gift. Uh, and so they they jumped in with both feet, uh, Abram and Sarah, uh, and um, and God promised to protect them, uh, but that didn't stop them from uh, from making some compromising decisions. So twice, twice, uh, Abram told Sarah as they were uh, journeying, and they ended up in uh, hostile territory. Pretend to be my sibling. Uh, they'll take you uh, uh, as a wife, but it'll spare our lives, uh, and, and, and I will survive, and, uh, and we'll be able to continue on our journey. And so twice that happened. Uh, God uh, watched over them and, and, and returned them to each other, uh, but twice Sarah was passed off as a sibling so that uh, she could be given, uh, she was a beautiful woman, so that she could be given to, uh, uh, to a potential uh, hostile person. Uh, hostile leader. Uh, and so they continue, they survive that, uh, and uh, God comes to them again and uh, affirms this commitment that you will be able uh, to have children, that your children will outnumber the stars. A great nation uh, will come from you. And uh, Sarah uh, laughs uh, as they get longer in the tooth, uh, but Abram doesn't give up on that. But at some point, Sarah thought, maybe I'm the problem. Maybe I'm the reason that this isn't happening. So tells Abram, uh, Abraham now, uh, take Hagar, uh, my servant, uh, and, and have a child with her so that, so that God's uh, promise might be fulfilled. And Abraham does it. Doesn't ask God whether this is, uh, uh, this is God's plan. Uh, in some ways, this is a, a show that, of, of limited faith, that, he, uh, that both he hasn't uh, trusted God enough to 
uh, to not pass off Sarah as his sister, and he hasn't trusted God uh, enough to uh, to be faithful to Sarah and not take uh, on this the servant girl as, as a potential uh, co-parent. Uh, so he does that, and he has a child, uh, Ishmael. Uh, and then at some point, Sarah can't stand it. Uh, she's been watching day in and day out uh, as Abram's, Abraham's affection grows and grows for this child, and she still cannot have a child uh, uh, of her own. Uh, and even, um, even when she does, uh, it's still difficult to see his, his affection towards, uh, towards Ishmael. So she eventually asks Abram to, uh, to have her dismissed and Ishmael uh, uh, ex exiled. And Abram, to his credit, does ask God first, uh, and God does say that uh, he will watch over uh, Ishmael, watch over Hagar. Uh, and, so, uh, and so they exit the scene uh, protected by God. Uh, but that's sort of the, the, the pretext for where we are now in the story. And so now there's one child. Uh, there's one child, Isaac, uh, the, only, uh, the only son uh, that, that Sarah will ever have. Um, and, and the only son that Abraham knows for certain that he has. And God comes and says, and he says, says it very specifically. So there's no ambiguity. Abraham, take your son, your beloved son, Isaac, the son that, the, your only son, Isaac, the son that you love, take him and sacrifice him. And he does. Uh, they don't discuss it. Uh, I, I don't have any reason to believe that Sarah is brought into the conversation. I don't think Isaac certainly not brought into the conversation. So Abraham wakes up the next day, packs his bags, uh, gets his crew, uh, brings the firewood and everything that he would need uh, and heads uh, to Mount Moriah uh, to wait further instruction. Uh, takes Isaac with him. Halfway there uh, on a three day journey, uh, Isaac turns to, uh, to his dad and says, dad, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, God will provide. And we don't know at this moment whether Isaac's starting to realize, wait, what's my role in this? Uh, but I can't even imagine. Uh, and so they continue. And you can only only begin to imagine what must be going on in, inside Abraham, um, uh, who's fallen short in, uh, in his fidelity or his trust of, of God uh, before. But, but this is a test. Uh, and, and they continue and they get there and they build the, um, uh, the fire and he binds his son. And I, I, this is where it gets too much to, uh, uh, to handle as a parent um, or as, as part of, 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 of the human race. Uh, he looks his son uh, in the eye. Um, he puts him on that altar uh, and he, he, he takes the, the knife and... Uh, and begins to, to come down as if he's going to take his own son's life. Uh, and I can't imagine what must be going through the son's, uh, the son's soul and being, uh, the irreparability of the whole thing, um, of what, what it must be like to, uh, to be Abraham in this moment, uh, where Sarah would be uh, when he returns without, without their only son. Uh, and the damage it would do to their relationship, uh, that the one thing um, that that she had, uh, her son, is no longer there. All of that um, is circling in the story uh, as he gets ready to, to draw that knife down into his son, uh, and that's when the angel intercedes uh, and says, um, Abraham, don't do it. Um, and uh, the attention is then turned to, uh, to the ram. Uh, the, and the ram that's caught in the thicket, and they pull the ram, and they make that the sacrifice. Um, and the angel certainly says, "You know, you've passed the test. Uh, your faith is uh, is beyond question. Uh, do not do this. Uh, God will provide, and God provided. And on that uh, site, Mount Moriah, uh, the name means God will provide. And, and that's um, how the story ends. But I still can't listen to that story without thinking." What's that trip home like? Uh, does Isaac ever get to look in his dad's eyes again and not have that fear? Um, uh, what about Abraham? Uh, he spends his whole life realizing how close he came to taking his son's life. And, um, 
and my my guess is that Sarah is never uh, even uh, even slightly aware that this whole situation took place. Uh, so those are the troubling parts of the story. Uh, but where is uh, the sustenance? Where is uh, the healing and then the grace in the story? Uh, the first part uh, is certainly worth knowing that at the time that Abraham was um, was called to do this. Uh, Sacrificing your child, your firstborn, uh, wasn't uncommon uh, in, in in other traditions that were were, were certainly uh, close enough at hand to, to to be in Abraham's conscience. Um, and you can ask the question: Was Abraham really called to do this, uh, or did he believe that's what he was called to do because uh, that those traditions existed, or was God trying to show Abraham that that's not the kind of God that he that he is, uh, that God wouldn't demand that of him. Um, or was it a test of faith? Um, but but it's certainly uh, important to know that that tradition existed uh, and that God was uh, showing himself to be a God uh, up and against that reality. And that ended um, uh, that tradition. Certainly it, as, um, as the law is handed to Moses, uh, it is prohibited uh, in the law that, uh, that people would sac continue to sacrifice children. Uh, so that's a part of the story that's certainly worth knowing. Um, and I'm struck by the, the, the name that it's given in the Jewish tradition, Akedah, which means the binding, um, because there's also the unbinding. And how many of us uh, feel bound in so many ways? Um, so many ways we feel stuck, we see no way out, um, and yet God can work in that, in that context, that God can unbind us, uh, no matter how uh, desperate it seems. Uh, in this story, certainly, all the way to the very last moment, uh, there seemed like no way out, um, and, and God unbound all of them uh, in that. Um, the God will provide, that, um, that, that God's working well beyond what we can see and imagine, and that, that God will take care of us, that God will provide. Um, the trust, uh, do we trust God enough uh, to go where we don't want to go? Do we trust God enough to, to believe that, uh, that God will take care of us, that God will fulfill God's promise to us? Um, I certainly don't think that will uh, involve us sacrificing um, our children, but there will be sacrifice. Uh, do we trust God uh, to make those sacrifices? Um, and, and that this journey will have cost. Uh, we read this story both um, both on Good Friday and uh, at the Easter Vigil, uh, both because it speaks to the cross that we're called to bear, uh, and it speaks to a God uh, that won't let it end the way uh, the story looks like it's, it's going to end. Um, and both of those are true. And obviously, uh, the last part is that this echoes uh, our, our Easter story, our Good Friday and our Easter story. Uh, where God did what God, uh, in the end, uh, wouldn't ask of us uh, to give his only begotten son uh, so that we would know the, 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 the richness, the fullness uh, of his love. Uh, as we struggle, as, 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 as we torture ourselves uh, with the, the details of this story and the lives that would be impacted, uh, it definitely points towards the love of, of God that is poured out for us, um, that is beyond all measure. Uh, and uh, and that is part of that unbinding that that love is is ours that love is poured out for us um, and that God that uh, that loves us will unbind us of all the burdens that we carry uh, wherever we find ourselves in that story whichever character um, we put ourselves in uh, it is critical that we're reminded that God's love will unbind us and that God will provide amen Hello, I'm going to be singing hymn 529, In Christ There Is No East or West.
Remember that life is short, and we have too little time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be quick to be kind, make haste to love. May the blessing of God Almighty, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you always. Our worship is now ended, and our service in the world begins. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. From the Petty family to our St. James family, we love and miss you.